Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here today in the house of God. Welcome every one of you. We appreciate our visitors that's visiting with us today. Always good to meet in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. I'm hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration. Take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 16. I'm going to speak on this subject, Lessons from a Lost Soul. Lessons from a Lost Soul. Now this tape will be tape number 271. And you can write in and get this tape. We appreciate the good musical program this morning that Brother Tony had lined up for us. All of it was real good. And we appreciate it. It's on cassette tape. And then the message will be on cassette tape. And these tape will be available for $3 each. And the gift is used to help defray our radio expense. You pray for me and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday, you can get the daily broadcast. So I hope that you will write to me, listen to the broadcast each week, and on the Lord's Day if possible, if you're not in the house of God. And let me hear from you, because we work us together in getting out the gospel, and this is a home mission work. Now, I know if you love God, you believe in home missions as well as foreign missions. Now, in the book of Luke, chapter 16, beginning with verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid his gate full of sores. And designed to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and sent Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is compton, thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix. So they which have passed from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us who would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went of them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That's reading from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Now there's a cult in the land today. The Russellites, they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, but they're really not Jehovah's Witnesses. They're Satan's Witnesses, and it's a cult, and they don't believe that this actually happened. They call this a parable, but this is not a parable because this actually happened. Nowhere in the Bible do you find where Jesus ever called people by name in a parable. This is something that actually took place, and we find here a lesson from a lost soul. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. And we see that today from the message Number one, the first lesson I want us to notice is this, that a man may have a beautiful appearance in the sight of men and yet be utterly corrupt in the sight of God. 
That's exactly the picture here. In verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. This man was one of the greatest and best dressed men of his day. And he looked good on the outside. There was a purple and fine linen of a man's righteousness, of course, will never beautify in the eyes of God. That is man's own righteousness. God looks at the heart of men. There are those who think they're in need of nothing and don't know they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, according to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. And that's a picture of Dives here. He didn't think he needed anything. He was well fixed. He had plenty of money, had a lot of friends, no doubt, well dressed, getting along fine, living in luxury. And he looked real good on the outside. But deep down on the inside of this man, it looked like a graveyard with dead men's bones. He was corrupt on the inside. That's a lesson we see here, number one. Number two, that a man may be poor and loathsome in the eyes of his neighbor and yet be rich and beautiful in the sight of God. That was Lazarus here. He was gotten emaciated. He was a man that looked terrible in the eyes of people that passed by. No doubt they said, look at that poor old fellow there. He's going to die quite soon. His body is covered with sores, bones penetrating almost through his skin. Poor man. He looks terrible. I can't hardly look at that man, they would say. And he looked terrible to people on the outside. But on the inside, he was beautiful. He was a child of God. Verses 21, 19, 21, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus was laid his gate full of sores and designed to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table more the dogs came and licked his sores. The only friends he had in the world were the dogs. They came and they licked the poor old beggar's sores. Evidently, that may have eased the pain somewhat. Somebody said a dog has a healing virtue in his tongue. I don't know. But anyway, he licked this man's sores. The Lord looks not on the outward appearance. God looks on the inward appearance. We have the soul of Lazarus here, a precious jewel to God. Although he dwelled in a frail, emaciated body. And yet he was beautiful on the inside. God looked at him from within. Man looked at him from without. You must remember that. God looks on the heart of men. Man looks on the outward appearance of men. You always remember that. Never forget it. Don't misjudge anyone. You don't know their hearts. You know what's on the inside. They may not look too well on the outside, but they may be rich and beautiful and lovely on the inside as far as God is concerned. Then we move on to lesson number three, and that is that a man may have put the barrel of a dog, or may have but the barrel of a dog, and yet be attended by the angels of God. Here's a poor man. Only had the barrel of a dog. He was cast aside. The dogs lay beside him. And when he died, they cast him away like a dead dog. But did you know angels came to that? They saw what was going on. In verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Someone said they rattled his bones over the stones. He's only a pauper whom no one owns. That was a picture of poor Lazarus. Nobody cared for him. If he happened to be in the way, they might kick him and knock him aside and say, get these bones and these sores and this dying man away from me. But inside he was beautiful. And the angel said, I'm going to his funeral. And angels came down from heaven. And there they stood by, and when his soul left his body, they escorted that soul into the paradise of Abraham's bosom, which at that time was down in the heart of the earth. The angels had a journey to make. They said, we're going to carry this man's soul down into Abraham's bosom, and that they did. Nobody cared for him while he was on the earth, but the angels did, God did. And they came to his rescue and escorted his soul down into Abraham's bosom. Now the fourth lesson we learn is this one. That a man may have a pompous funeral and at the same time be a miserable soul. 
Can you imagine what was taking place as they provided this funeral? Oh, they had the best of of a coffin. They had the best coffin, the best material. They could dress him in. They had no doubt the most beautiful flowers. Had some old apostate to come and preach his funeral. And there they had a wonderful funeral for this man called Ives, the rich man. He was somewhat like the man sitting beside the road. He saw a funeral procession coming along. And they had the body in a golden hearse. That man said, man, I'm telling you, I want you to look at this. I mean, that's living. I mean, that's living that, to be in that golden hearse. But that's dead wrong. A man on the inside of that golden hearse was dead. He was not living. He was dead as far as that body was concerned. And so they had a funeral for this man, no doubt, that drew in hundreds of people. They said, you know, old Ives died. That rich man on the hill in the mansion, he died. And we want to go and pay our final respects. And they gathered around while they had that great funeral. But he was down in hell, screaming and crying and begging and pleading, miserable while they were having that funeral. The same thing happens today in many, many churches. As a preacher stands up and tries to say his final words to comfort maybe the loved ones, and maybe that poor soul is down in hell screaming and begging for just a drop of water. I don't care what kind of music you may have, how well the minister may speak, or what kind of oratory he may perform, beloved, listen to me. If that soul's in hell, is to no avail. He's screaming down there in the regions of the damned. They're begging and pleading for just a little drink of water to cool his parched tongue. There'd be more real mourners at some funerals if they only could see within that veil. If they could see where that soul went, there'd be more weeping and wailing and mourning and crying at funerals are people that die without God. Many years ago, I conducted a funeral over in Madison County near Danielsville. Someone told me before the funeral, said, Now, preacher, I want to warn you. Said, those are people, are very emotional people. And you might as well expect most anything to happen. I conducted that funeral. At the close of that funeral, some of those loved ones came down. And they tried to take that man out of the coffin. They put the arms around him, trying to get him out of there. They said, you're not going to bury him. We're not going to allow for it. You're not going to bury our loved one. And they wept and they wailed. And the undertakers had to come and take him away from the coffin and push him back to keep them from taking that body out. They said, you're not going to bury our loved one. They went out to the grave and they had to hold him back from the grave because they wanted to steal, try, seem to try to get in the grave with this man. And that was a terrible thing. I don't know the man, if he died without God, if they could have seen him down in hell, weeping and mourning and screaming and begging for water. I just surmise that you could have heard him for miles around as they wept and mourned and cried. Down in hell, Dives is crying and screaming and praying while they're holding that funeral up on the earth. That happens many times. And then we come to thought number five, lesson number five, and that is a man may have abundance of this world's goods and yet in the world to come be utterly destitute of the most common mercy. This man went liking for nothing. He had the best of transportation, no doubt. He rode maybe in golden carriages. Maybe his horses had golden harness on them. He had expert drivers. He was dressed in purple and fine linen. He had jewelry on his body. That man really lived it up. And yet, beloved, now we find that he's utterly destitute. He has nothing. He has nothing. I think about that man that died with AIDS, that homosexual, uh, homosexual uh, La Roche, whatever his name was, that pianist, uh, that, that uh, queer that died so wealthy. And yet, beloved, they had such a great big to do about that. And many other people out of Hollywood dying with AIDS because they're homosexuals. And yet they make big to do about them. Probably their souls are down in hell and they're screaming for mercy. Just a little water down in hell to cool their parched tongue. And so we find here that this man is destitute. He doesn't have a thing on the earth. He liked for nothing. 
lived in a mansion, had the best of funny to in his home, had all the money he wanted to spend, best of foods to eat, and yet down in hell he has nothing. He's a pauper. He's even down there without mercy, destitute of mercy. The Bible says in verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He didn't say, bring me a dip of water. He didn't say, bring me a cup of water. Oh, he said, if Lazarus, I don't care about that emaciated body with sores on his hands. Just let him dip that old sore finger just in some water and bring me a drop, just a drop. Oh, Father Abraham, if I had just a drop of that water on my tongue, I believe it would help me. Upon the earth, he had alcoholic beverages. He had all the wine he wanted to drink. And then down in hell, he had nothing. There he was begging even for mercy, but no mercy came. He was destitute. The everlasting thirst for a drop of water is an awful experience to a man who never knew what want was upon the earth. This man was probably born in riches and luxury. And he didn't want for anything. Probably his parents bought him the best of toys of that day. And as he grew up, they bought him most anything that he desired. They didn't let that boy go liking for anything. When he married, he had the best of servants and a home and the best of foods. But down in hell, he can't even get any mercy. Down there, he's begging for mercy. Oh, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Lesson number six, that if a man neglects his opportunity in this life, in the life to come, he'll have a good cause to remember his folly while upon the earth, while he was on the earth. You think you're going to forget about the opportunities you had to get right with God, the good deeds you could have done, and the way you treated people. No, no. Down in hell, you'll have these memories forever. In verse 25, Abraham said, Son, remember in thy lifetime. I believe when a person dies and goes to hell, I believe he remembers every time he had a chance to get saved and he rejected that. I believe he remembers every time he cursed the preacher, said hard things about the man of God, criticized the church of the living God, criticized God's people, mistreated his neighbor. Down in hell, they say, if I could just go back and redo some things and undo some things that I did, I would gladly do so. They remember these things. When a man dies and goes to hell, he doesn't go down there to sleep. He doesn't go to forget things. I was in a place not too long ago, and, and they gave someone medicine. Uh, it was said the medicine was given to this individual. I either read it or saw it or been there. I forget now. But anyway, um, uh, this person said he was given some medicine. He didn't even know he'd been to sleep. The preacher, it was a preacher preaching the other night. I heard him. He went to the hospital, and there they would perform surgery upon him. And, and uh, he said, well, when are you going to put me to sleep? He said, well, we've already done the surgery. You've already been asleep. He said, I don't remember going to sleep. And, and they said, no, we gave you something to blot out your memory. No, you didn't remember going to sleep. And they do have medication today that can blot out your memory. When my brother died, the family went in to tell my mother about it. And we sat down and we broke the news to my mother about my brother dying at the age of 51 with a massive heart attack. My mother wept and she was weeping uncontrollably. And then they came in and gave my mother some medicine. And you know, she never again, as long as she lived, and she lived many years, she never again mentioned his name. She never asked where he was. She never asked one thing about him. She lived the rest of her days as though he had never been born on this earth. They gave her a medication that blotted the memory of my brother out of her mind completely. And she never asked about him anymore. Never mentioned his name anymore. And she lived many years upon the earth. They have that type of medication. But they can't use that down in hell. They don't have it down there. They remember everything they did on the earth. They remember cursing. They remember the liquor they drank. They remember gambling. They remember the dope. That, they remember everything that they did on the earth. It was evil. They remember that in hell over and over and over again. It's in their minds. 
You know you have a lot of people today, they get so depressed and maybe get on alcohol or get into trouble. And they say, well, I think what I'll do, I'll just go ahead and commit suicide and that'll take care of it. No, you don't. When you commit suicide, you jump out of the fire, of the frying pan into the fire. You go to a far worse place. You jump right out of that frying pan, right into the fire when you commit suicide. A lot of people thought, well, I'll take my life and that'll end it all and I'll get out of my problems. No, you don't. Your problem just begins when you take your life. You haven't even thought about what you're going to suffer if you commit suicide and go to hell. That's a terrible thing. And you're going to carry your memory with you and you're going to remember everything, every time your parents tried to get you to do right and you didn't do it. Every time you did something wrong, you shouldn't have done it. You're going to remember that when you go to hell. You're going to carry that memory. And then lesson number seven, that those saints and sinners may meet together now the time is coming when they must be eternally separated. Upon this earth, you meet with your loved ones. You may have a companion that's lost. You meet together. You eat together. You may have children that are lost. You meet together. There you associate together. You have friends. You may be worked by people that you love and you think a lot of them. And there you're together. And you look forward to seeing them. You look forward to seeing people at the church. And you look forward to seeing people on your job, in your community. And you have reunions and there you celebrate uh, your graduation, uh, time of graduation maybe and uh, other special occasions. And you're glad to see your old friends. But you know if you know God and they don't know God, you won't be meeting anymore after this life. After you die, you'll never see them again. After you die, you'll never meet them again. You'll never say, hello, how are you getting along? You'll never say, it's good to see you again at the reunion. Glad you came home to know, no. No, no, when you die, you've seen these lost people for the last time. You'll never lay your eyes on them again. Parents that have children that die and go to hell, you'll never see them again. You've seen them the last time. Children that have parents that die and go to hell, you'll never see them again. You've seen them for the last time. If you have a companion, a friend, a loved one that die and go to hell and you're saved, you'll never, never see them again. You have seen them for the last time. You'll never lay eyes on them anymore. And so down here in hell, they were eternally separated. They could not get together anymore for any fellowship whatsoever. They couldn't. At this particular time, there was a gulf between the two. Now, Dives could look across and see Lazarus in his bosom. But paradise has been changed today. That doesn't happen anymore. When a person dies today, he goes into the third heaven into paradise Sinner dies, he goes to hell. You never see one another anymore. No, sir. In verse 26, and beside all this between us, you there's a great gulf fixed. So they was passing from history, you cannot, neither can they pass us that would come from this. There's no way to get together. It's impossible for you to get with your loved ones again if they die without God or you die without God and they die saved. That's an eternal separation. No more reunions, no more how you today, no more seeing them again. Earth relationships will avail nothing with the gray when the great guff is fixed. I don't care how close you are. We have some people in this world that's real close. I mean, uh, uh, parents that are close, children that are close. But that come in a separation time when closeness will be no more. All the prayers and the penance of the papacy of the purgatory will never br bridge this guff. That's fixed. No such thing as purgatory in the first place. But anyway, you might try to make yourself believe that after you die, you're going to be purged and then go to heaven. No, no. If you die in your sins, you go straight to hell as a Martin to his God. There's no second chance. You can't get right after you die. If you go to heaven, you better get right before you die. Don't you believe the lie of the devil? You're not going to be purged of anything after you die as a sinner. You're going straight to hell, and from there the judgment Bob God, from there the lake of fire. That's exactly what God said in the book, and you better believe the Bible. And so we see then, number eight, that the prayers of lost can avail nothing for themselves or for others. In verse 24, he cried for mercy, and he cried for water. There the prayers of lost can avail nothing. There in hell they can pray forever until they're uh, belched out and stand before the great white throne, but they're getting nowhere. No prayers are answered there. We cannot pray for the dead to avail anything. I've seen people this past week, and my heart goes out 
to the parents and loved ones of those precious sailors who were killed over yonder in that incident that happened in the Gulf. And I've heard them say, well, we're going to hold a prayer meeting for those uh, 36 or 37 men. Well, uh, you no don't need to hold a prayer meeting after they're dead. You can't pray for them. You can pray for their parents, but you need not try to pray for the dead. You're wasting your time. No need to pray for the dead. You can't help them after they're gone. If you're going to pray for anybody, pray for them before they die. You're making a mockery of prayer when you pray for the dead. That's abomination in sight of God. Now the pit of hell itself to try to make people think they're going to pray for the dead after they're dead and gone. You can't do that. Now is the time to pray while they're alive and you can get your prayer through to God. And then we come to the next thought. And that is um, those who will not hear and believe the word of God shall perish without remedy. So saith the Bible. Now the Bible says if you won't hear, if you won't repent, if you won't believe the gospel, then you're going to perish in that without remedy. Verses 29 through 31, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, my father Abraham, nay, father Abraham, but if one went of them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Oh, you listen to me. People say, well, if inmates in hell could come back today, walk up and down these aisles, then we'd all get saved. No, no. If the gospel of Jesus Christ won't bring you in, that won't bring you in. Poor old Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, came back from the dead. Did that get people saved? No, they wanted to re-kill him. They said, let's put him to death. Let's kill him because somebody's allowed to believe what he's talking about. And they wanted to kill Lazarus after he came back from the dead. When Jesus came back from the dead, uh, will people believe on him and trust him? He came back. Few will. You did. Some of you did. Some of you won't. Some of you out there in the radio listen to us right now. You won't believe in Jesus Christ. You won't believe in God. You won't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And he came back from the dead. And if people today could come back from hell and say, I've been down there you better get right. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't accept it. If the gospel of Jesus Christ don't do the job, then nothing else will. God plainly tells us it comes by faith, cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that's the only thing that's going to reach poor lost sinners. It is the word of God. The Israelites saw his wonders, but they murmured against him in the wilderness. They saw the great moving of God at the Red Sea. They ate the manna that came down from heaven and they drank the water that Meribeth and they uh, that came out of the rock and they, uh, they didn't believe him. They murmured and complained about it after they saw those great miracles. Many saw the miracles of Christ and yet they hated him. When Jesus raised the dead, when he healed on the Sabbath, when he helped people, they hate him that much the more. They said, there he is healing a man on the Sabbath day. He ought to be killed. Anybody to heal a man on the Sabbath day ought to be killed. And they said, let's kill that man, Jesus. And they finally did. They finally killed him. They nailed him to a cross. And there he died on Calvary's cross. And there he died for the sins of mankind. Many, you know, said, um, uh, if old Lazarus there comes out of that grave, uh, then we're going to believe in him. And, and um, some few may have, but most of them said, that man's come up out of the grave. They've been here four days. And uh, we better do something with him because if we don't, uh, the man that brought him out of the grave calls his name Jesus, uh, that they might believe in him. Let's, let's put him to death. Let's kill him. See, people hate the gospel. This ungodly world hates the gospel of Jesus Christ. This ungodly world hates this Baptist preacher that's now preaching to you. People hate me. There's people, if they could kill me and get by with it, they'd do it today and laugh about it. Beloved, listen, people that stand for God and preach the gospel, it's going to be hated when they preach the whole counsel of God. I have some people that would almost lay down their life for me. They love me that much. I have others, if they could kill me right now and get by with it, then they would try to do it. A man wrote me some time ago. I just read the scriptures over there in Timothy where it talks about uh, eating meat and those forbidden to marry and so forth. Read down that scripture. And that happened to cut cross grain to his religion. And he wrote me a letter. He's on the way from Florida up into Niceville, Tennessee. And he said, uh, if I ever hear you 
ever hear you make a statement like that again. I was reading the word of God. He said, I'll do everything in my power to shut your mouth. Well, in other words, he said, I'd kill you if I ever heard you read that again or say that again. I, I would kill you. Well, his religions killed millions of God's people in years gone by. And he'd do the same thing. Now, you listen to me. If you won't believe the word of God, won't trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's no hope for you. That's the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. I have given you some lessons. In fact, I've given you about uh, nine lessons from this scripture, this narrative here, the scripture, the word of God, the story Jesus gave, which is a true story. I've given you these nine lessons. And if you're here today and you're unsaved, do you, do you have any guarantee that you won't be in hell uh, an hour from now? Do you have any guarantee you won't be in hell when the sun goes down tonight? Do you have any guarantee you won't be in hell tomorrow? You certainly don't. People in hell today, many of them, intended to have gotten saved before they died and they died without God. And there'd be multitudes that died a day without Jesus Christ and drop into hell. And they fully intend to get right with God someday, but they're waiting too late. Now you better do something about it now while you're able to do something about it. Because you might not have a chance if you keep procrastinating. You need to get right with God. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Father, I pray today you'll take the message and use it to your glory. May your name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. Lord, I'm so glad one day you saved me. God, I deserve to go to hell, but you saved me. Father, I thank you for my loved ones that are saved. I thank you for others that are saved, but my heart is grieved about many that are not saved that may die and go to hell. God, help us today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Trace is going to play a stanza so, and while she plays, if you're here unsaved, backslidden on God, or you want to join this church, we receive members. If any other reason you want to come, you may walk down this aisle. Tony will be here to help you. Brother Carla right here can help you. I'll help you. We'll do what we can to help you. Would you come while we wait, while she plays?